Good morning. Great worship already. I just, uh, I'm so excited to, to be here this morning, so excited to be here and worship with you. Uh, just so you know, really the intent of this morning, uh, we have a big holiday coming up. Now, we celebrate the resurrection, and, or should celebrate the resurrection, every single day of our life. But there is one of those Days that we set aside so that we will have the opportunity to just even more so express our hearts to the Lord saying thank you for paying our debt. We praise you Jesus for paying our debt and for your resurrection and the new hope that we have in you. And uh, and I hope that you you hear that in the music. I hope that you uh, saw it in the in the baptism this morning. Uh, this is all about the work and the ministry of Christ. And my intent and our intent this morning is to help you uh, just to prepare your heart for that special day of celebrating uh, the Lord's resurrection on Easter Sunday. And listen, I know things get busy. Uh, our lives happen and we blink and we're, all, we're already to, to the end of, of uh, toward the end of March. And it's, it's, it's really hard to believe just from a, a, t- a time perspe- uh, perspective. Um, I, what I want you to do, uh, even beginning today, I, I want you to prepare your hearts for worship every day and celebrate his resurrection every day. But moreover, I want to see you, and I want to encourage you, and I'm going to be encouraging myself in this, uh, is to prepare for worship on Easter Sunday. Now, there's a lot of things that we can, that we can do in that, and I want to encourage you, if you are a parent, make this fun for your children. Uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that my family does, and we've been doing it for several years now, uh, we make this, uh, uh, this Play-Doh mountain. Uh, Mindy makes some, makes some uh, Play-Doh, and she shapes it around. We, we take a, 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 a canned good, and we lay over this, this, this canned good, and we, we create Golgotha, uh, essentially. Uh, we, we create the mountain, but on in the inside of the mountain, the purpose of that little tin can is, is the tomb. And so we, we really take that Passion Week, which is beginning next Sunday, and, and just keep instilling. It's just, honestly, it's just not for Jonathan. It's for me, too. I mean, it's, listen, it's fun painting the Play-Doh Mountain. I mean, it really is. Pulling out all your colors and, and making figures out of, um, uh, what's that stuff called, Mindy, the... Pipe, pipe cleaners, and you twist the pipe cleaners, and you make the characters, and of course Jesus is white, and, and uh, Judas is red, and, and, and we, we, we have a lot of fun doing that. And I want to encourage you just to think creatively uh, as a parent, if you're, if you're not a parent or uh, you're single, you know, there, there are some creative things that you can do uh, during Passion Week to, to think about uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, and I really want to encourage you to do that. Uh, one, I mean, one of the, another practical thing that you could do is just get on the uh, internet and, and, and you know, study, study the, the, the days of what happened and, and just put yourself in, in the shoes of the disciples and what was going on that week before uh, Jesus uh, was, was crucified, buried, and rose again. It really is something that, that we, uh, we want to be intentional about, and that's, that's a word that I, w- I want to keep putting before you. Be intentional uh, in, in all of these uh, seasons as... Uh, Noel Piper, John Piper's wife, uh, calls it, it's, it, she puts it under this classification of treasuring God in your traditions. Uh, and I want to encourage you to encourage you to do that as well. Think creatively about what you can do uh, in, the, in the coming days. Now, there's some practical things that, that if you think about the message and what's been, uh, what's been shared uh, this morning through baptism, through song, and we're about to open up God's word. You know, there, there is a message, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a message that we have for, uh, f- uh, f- for, for the world. And when we stand here and we lift our hands up to, to the Lord and we say, oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. I mean, that's, that's, that's an incredible, incredible message of hope that we have. And, and I don't know if you, if, practically speaking, if, if you've ever had somebody pay a debt that you owe. I mean, it, it is gracious. It is incredible. When, when somebody comes in, maybe even practically speaking in your life, you've experienced where somebody came in and paid for something for you. 
And, that, and that's literally what happened on the cross. Jesus paid the debt of the wrath of God against me, against us. If we, and, and he did it by, 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 by shedding his blood on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And, and so when we sing these songs, it's, it's for us to celebrate, but don't forget that there are individuals out there that can't sing that song. Uh, they, they don't know what it means to lift up their eyes to the Lord and say, I praise you for paying my debt. They, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, they've been blinded by the God of this age. And, and, and so some practical things I want to encourage you to do as we're preparing for Easter. Easter, Easter weekend is going to be a great weekend for us as a, as a body of believers, but I, we need your help. And we were sitting in staff meeting a, a couple of weeks ago and, uh, you know, we, we, we want to do all that we can to advertise uh, what's going on in, in, at, at Riverside on Easter weekend. And it's going to be a great weekend. We're going to have uh, Secret Church on, on Friday night. Uh, it's from 6 p.m. to 12 p.m. midnight. I mean, it's a, listen, it, it, it is a, uh, or, or 12, 12 midnight. It is a extensive Bible study, and it's going to be on heaven and hell and the end times. And I promise you, uh, I, have, I, I did it for the first time last year uh, for, the, for that uh, amount of time, and it was a blessing. Now, I will tell you, some, and if you were there, um, if you filled in all of your bl- blanks, I need to give you a high five because I stopped. <laughs> I literally just stopped because it was so, it was so much uh, information, so much good theology that we were being given uh, through, through David Platt and that simulcast that we had. Uh, it's, it's a night of worship. It's a, it's a night of learning for us. And, 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 and it's a, honestly, it's a very simple night. We don't, we don't go all out on this night. It's a very simple night, and it's uh, supposed to help us remember uh, our, our persecuted brothers and sisters across the world. And, and I, I want to encourage you, if you haven't signed up for that, do that on our website. Some of you I know have already done it in your impact groups, your small groups. Uh, go to our website, riversidebaptist.com. You'll see the Secret Church logo. Click on that and you'll be able to register. It's going to be a great night. Uh, uh, we won't have anything uh, uh, Saturday morning, uh, but Sunday will be our, our big worship day. And I really want, to, want, to, want you to be a part of that day. Uh, I want you to help in this, though. And this is what came out of staff meeting. We'll do all we can on our end to communicate what's going on electronically through Twitter and Facebook and our website. But you know what makes the, um, what, what makes the most or the largest impression on an individual? It's when you take the opportunity to invite them to church on, on Easter Sunday. And so, just so you know, there's little cards that Joshua has made up. They're available in the West foyer when you exit today. Pick up as many as you need, but use them. And over these next two weeks, there are individuals, I promise you, there are individuals within your sphere of influence that are thinking about, what do I do on Easter Sunday? And all they're doing is is looking for somebody like you and like me to invite them. And so I, I want to encourage you, pick up a couple of those cards and, and, and invite somebody to come to church with you on Easter Sunday. It's going to be a special Sunday It's because it's all about the Lord. And I know Pastor Tony wouldn't want me to make a big deal out of this, but guess what? This one going to be one of his first Sundays back with us. He's going to preach Easter Sunday. We still don't, we're still working out the start date. I'll hopefully have, have that all worked out uh, uh, this, uh, this, this upcoming week. But it, you know, it, it'll be a good opportunity to, to introduce, and it's okay to do this, to introduce somebody to our new pastor to let them hear from him. It's going to be a good Sunday, and, but here's the deal. You know people, and I know people, that are right now, they're not in church, and they're just looking for somebody to, to invite them. It, sometimes it, it is a little bit threatening to walk into an environment like this, but if you go and you personally invite them and make, make, make it a priority to engage somebody with the gospel this Easter weekend, I promise you the Lord will bless it. Now, I want you to do, I want you to do me a favor. Calls us. Calls our facility team, our usher crews, calls us to make sure that the balconies are open on Easter Sunday. Uh, we want people in, in, in the balconies. That's traditionally what we've done. And it, it, it's not, listen, it's not about numbers, but numbers do, numbers do represent people. And they represent souls. And so I want to just continue to encourage you to do that. Uh, if you're looking for a service opportunity, uh, Michael Fant and his team um, uh, are, are looking for some individuals to, um, uh, to help with uh, Riverside and Espanol, our Hispanic congregation. 
and they have these door hangers that are going to go out next, uh, next Saturday uh, morning. And, and so if you're interested in, uh, uh, in, in helping uh, uh, in our community and handing out these door hangers, uh, would you please uh, see Michael Fant on your way out? He said he would be waiting there. If you don't see him or you don't know who Michael is, just call the church office, give me your, or, or give our receptionist your contact information, and we will uh, we'll make sure that you have that opportunity to help Michael Fant and Pastor Jaime uh, and, and his team on, on next Saturday. That's quite a large introduction. Turn your Bibles with me to, uh, to John chapter 13. And again, the, the, the intent of this morning, the intent of this morning is for us to stop, to take a deep breath, and to prepare our hearts for, for Easter Sunday. I mean, I, one of the things that I love about preaching after a baptism, and I, I'll give you a little, a little bit of insight into my heart and, uh, and, and, and some things. I love preaching after a baptism because I'm standing up here with a soaking wet arm. Um, <laughs> And it, but it reminds me, it reminds me that there were a couple of individuals that, that trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, confessed their faith in him, and are ready to walk with him and follow him. And, and, and this is, this is why, we're, why we're here this morning. We're here to follow him. And, and I, want, I want you, to, in, in these next few minutes, I'm gonna, we're going to read this text in John 13 and, and, and spend some time looking at it. I, I want to caution you, though, because I, I'm guilty of this as well, and y'all have heard me say this before. When you come to familiar texts, it's easy just to read, and it's easy just to glance over them. But there's a lot of, uh, for lack of better words, there's a lot of drama going on in, in John chapter 13 right now. Uh, there, there is a significant shift that's happened, that happens in the structure, the overall structure of the book of John between John chapter 12 and John chapter 13. And what's taking place is Jesus is he's shifting his ministry to this, from this great public ministry and he's shifting it back to his private ministry and where he is ministering to his disciples. And, and, and so in John chapter 13, Oh, let me just set up the, what, what happened in the end of, uh, of John chapter 12. Just a couple of things that, that Jesus reminds the people, reminds the crowd of. John chapter 12, you don't have to turn there uh, unless you just want to flip one page. But in uh, uh, verse 35, he says this. Light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. And so it's this, in, in, in these last verses, Jesus is, is, is calling out and putting out a call to the people to follow me. Be believe in me. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Believe in, in my work and believe uh, in all the miracles that you see. The seven uh, miracles in particular uh, between John 1 and John 12. Jesus was dis uh, displaying his authority. Uh, Jesus was displaying who he was. Uh, Jesus was letting the world know that I am God's son and I am here to save the world. And, and so, uh, following there in, um, uh, under that uh, element of saving the world, you drop down to verse 44. Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me, and whoever sees me, sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on that last day. For I have not spoken on, on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say? And what to speak. And I know that, this, that, that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And so in the end of John chapter 12, what you see happening is, is Jesus drawing his public ministry to a close. He makes one last appeal to the people. Will you follow me? Will you believe me? Believe in me. 
I have come to save the world, but believe in me. And there really is this contrast that happens at the end of, uh, of John chapter 12 that we begin to see even a, may, uh, even a much more clear picture in, in John chapter 13 as it relates to the end of, in, uh, at the individual level. John chapter 12, God is, uh, Jesus is, is proclaiming to the crowds, there are some who will believe in me and there were some who will reject me. And so in John chapter 13, this is where we'll spend the majority of our time this morning. What I'm going to do, we're just going to read through this text. I'm going to spend some time pointing out some, some keys that I, that I believe are, that are important for us to see. Uh, those things that are important uh, uh, for us to remember for many of us who may have read this text. And then I want to come back and I want to ask us four questions at the end as a point of application. John chapter 13, it says this. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew, (coughs) excuse me, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured out water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter backpedals real fast. And says to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has been bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he, who knew, for he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet, he put his outer garments on and resumed his place at the table and said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and you call me Lord. And you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do this as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Let's pray. Father, we truly do want to take a moment this morning pause and catch our breath and we want to prepare our hearts for celebrating you on Resurrection Sunday. And Father, we know that that's a couple of weeks off, but Lord, and Lord, we know that we should be celebrating your resurrection every day. But Father, there is something that is special when we come to celebrate. There is something that's special that we even see in, the, uh, in, our, old, uh, in, in our Old Testament and our um, uh, friends and believers there that they, they, cel- they had celebrations. They carved out times in their calendar to celebrate you and the great work that you have done. And Lord, we are going to do the same. But Lord, please don't let us get there without preparing our hearts beforehand. 
Lord, I pray that you would use this text this morning as a reminder to us of who you are and what you have called us to and what you want us to do in response to who you are. Lord, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for the way that you have, in, in so many ways, empowered us through your Spirit. And so, Father, by, the, by your Spirit this morning that dwells in us and by your Word, would you teach us? Would you take this text and shape and mold our hearts? Because it is truth. It was true when it was written, and it is true today for us. And so, Father, help us to, help us to see the truth of this Scripture and apply it to our lives as we celebrate your resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just thinking about this text, there's just a few things, and we're just, I'm just going to walk through and highlight some things. that I, I just, As I was reading and meditating on the Scripture, that I just believe that are so important for us to, to be reminded of. And, you know, this is, this is Passion Week. This is uh, Jesus, uh, you know, he is about to be crucified. He is with his disciples. He is with them and uh, celebrating this last meal. Uh, he is with them to, uh, to, to encourage them. And I, and I think that in many ways, when you, when you read this text, especially when Jesus knows, I mean, Jesus is realizing his purpose. This, his end is coming. Jesus came for a very particular purpose in this, uh, on this earth, and it was about to be fulfilled, and Jesus knew that it was about to be fulfilled. But here's, here's just in, in, the, in the overall context, the beginning right here, in, in, as, as John makes this switch from in, in describing Jesus' public ministry to his private ministry, there's something that's so important for us to see and be reminded of this morning. And it says that, 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 that his hour had come to depart uh, out of this world to the Father, having loved, listen to this, listen, listen to the language here, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, I don't know about you, but can you get easily distracted? I, I, I can get easily distracted. I, I, I can have, uh, I, I like to process a lot of information at one time, but sometimes it becomes so much that as I'm processing that information, that, that, that's all I can process. Now, think about Jesus and his perspective and that he is about to go to the cross. He realizes that he's about to, his life is about to come to an end. He, he knows that he's about to leave those whom he loves, but what is John recording here? And all of that, and all of that picture, and all of that picture that we see of Jesus, knowing that he's about to go to the cross, John points to the way that Jesus loved his disciples. And, and he went so far as this. The text says that Jesus loved them to the end. Now, Sometimes we get things lost in our English translations and uh, the, the intent. And there's another area I'll, I'll point out in this text uh, uh, later on. But, but it's, it's, not about, it's not about Jesus loving them to the end of his ministry. Now, that's not what this text is saying. It's, it's not saying that Jesus loved them to the end uh, of, his, uh, of his crucifixion and resurrection when he went back to heaven. That's not the case at all. This, this language is very emphatic, actually. The, the language here is saying that he loved them to the maximum. He loved them so much that, that there was no other way to love them more. And, and so that really, if you think about it, and as you're reading Scripture, it's always good uh, to, to take a look at the Scripture and, and see the character and the nature of God as revealed in Christ. And, and you see this right here, that Jesus loved his disciples. And so even about what, even what, looking forward and what is about to take place, it's all rooted and grounded in his love for his people. And you read this and, and, and you ask the question, well, that's great, Jason. Is that, is, that for, is that just for his disciples? And now I'd say, yes, but that is for you and I today to be reminded of the way that he loves his sons and his daughters. That is foundational. Listen, that is so foundational to what is about to take place in this text. And so John makes it very clear that he is pointing to the love of Christ, that he loved his disciples. He loves them. He loves you. He loves us. And, and, and he loves them so much. And don't forget what really is taking place at the table. 
Because there is another contrast that's going, and we don't really see it in this picture in John 13, but if you go over to Luke 22, you know what's in the hearts and the minds of the disciples. I won't ask you to turn there. You can go back and look at it later. But what's, what's going on in the hearts and the minds of the disciples, they're sitting around, and they were, as they were coming to this uh, table and preparing for this table, uh, they were preparing it and asking a question, who, who among them is the greatest? And, and, and so it really, you, you see this, this, this visible contrast to once again uh, of, of a of uh, God incarnate in, incarnate in Christ who loves his, pe- his sons and his daughters so much even when they are jockeying for position. I mean, John, the, 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 James and John, the sons of thunder, they, they, they wanted to sit at his, on his left and on his right. Went so far, asked his mother, hey, mommy, can you ask Jesus to, you know, rub elbows with Jesus and, and, and see if, if, if he can put us on the right and the left? And, and so this is really this, is this shameless act of jockeying and going around the table. But even in the midst of that, even, even in the midst of it, Jesus and John here is saying he loved them. He loved them to the end. A lot more is going on in this text. And, and during his supper, and the text says that, that the devil was, had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to, to betray Jesus. Knowing, and here, here's, here's, listen, you, you, you may think you may think that that would have caused Jesus a great deal of concern, knowing that he was about to get stabbed in the back by someone that was close to him, that had been in ministry with him, that had actually a, a, a high place within the twelve disciples in, mini, in, in managing uh, managing the financial affairs of the disciples. You would think that that would rock somebody's world, but it didn't rock Jesus' world at all. Because Jesus, in verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he, was, that he had everything. He had all authority. All authority in the end was been given to Christ. And so the Father had put all things in his hands, and that's why Jesus wasn't shaken at this. And that he had come from God, he knew where he came from. And he knew where he was going in the end. And because of, uh, because of that foundation, that foundational love that he has for his disciples, and because of the love that he has for the Father, and because the Father has given him all things, there was, there was, a, there was a, der- a, a degree of God-instilled confidence from the Father to Jesus. And so he knows his position. All authority. I mean, you think about the authority that you have, and you, we talked about this in recent weeks um, uh, from, uh, with, with Pastor Singh, the, 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 that element of authority. Well, Jesus has the ultimate authority. But look what he did. You, know, you want to think about somebody where the buck, the, the buck stops here? It, the buck stops at Jesus. All authority has been given to him. But look what he did. He said he wrote, the text says he rose from supper. And this picture that that you see in, in in the next in the next verses that he took off his outer garments, he laid them aside, and he took a towel, and he tied it around his waist. Now, what Jesus literally did in that picture, he took the position of a slave. Jesus was about to do the very thing. Now, I know this is a little bit. <clears throat> Now, this is a little bit speculative, but in Jewish culture, they had, when, when, when individuals walked into the house, they had individuals at the door ready to wash the disciples or, or wash people's feet as they entered the house so you didn't track in all the, all the gross things that, that, you would, that you would come in contact with. I uh, mean, in that day, listen, in that day, uh, sandals were in. And then there were no sidewalks, there were no asphalt roads, uh, it, was, it was dirt roads. And, and, and guess what? There were no automobiles, there were animals. And animals poop. And they poop in the street. And it gets nasty. It, it really, I'm, I'm, trying to, you know, I'm trying to paint a picture of nastiness here because it is, it is gross. I mean, I remember, <laughs> I remember uh, several years ago, uh, several years ago, we're on vacation and, and my, son, my son does not like to wear shoes. I mean, anytime you, I mean, he's always without shoes. And his feet get filthy. 
And so we're, we're literally sitting, sitting in my truck and we're on vacation and, you know, he hasn't had shoes on for, for, for forever and he sticks his big foot up in between, you know, I have, you know, the captain's chairs in, my, in that old SUV I used to have and he sticks his big foot up there and he gets this little, little you know, you know how little boys are, they like to get dirty uh, and, 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 and they like to be gross and, and he sticks his big foot up in between me and, and, and Mindy, and he looks, and he gets this little snicker on his face, and he says, uh, look, Mom, Dad, toe boogers. <laughs> and of course, we, we, we lost it, because we, it was funny. It was gross. And, and, and listen, it's even more gross in this text, and in, in, in the, in the element of, of the position that Jesus is taking here. I mean, there, there should be this element of us understanding that people you know, walk the streets, they got their feet dirty, they needed, they needed to be clean. And, and, and so Jesus takes on this position of a slave, he pours the water into a basin and begins to wash the disciples' feet. And he takes that towel, I mean, he's literally kneeling down with, uh, with, with his disciples. And, then, and listen, I mean, this is, this is another point of position that Jesus is taking as an example. I mean, kneeling down and washing the feet of these disciples, washing off the mud and the crud of the day, scrubbing them clean. And it really is, it really is this, picture of, uh, the, the, this picture of humility. And, and, and Jesus is being very intentional. Don't forget the context of what was going on prior to this meal. Remember the disciples were jockeying for position. They wanted to know who was greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus is showing them what it means what it means to be great. And, and so he washes the disciples' feet and he comes to Peter. And Peter, you know, we, we know from context and other context of Peter, he was a little bit of a hothead. And uh, he, he looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, you want to wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand but after your word, you will understand. And you know, Jesus was in this position where where the disciples, they were ready to make him the ruling king of the world instead of yielding to the fact that Jesus was the the suffering servant. And and, and so Peter looks at him and and he says, Jesus, your your text may say this. Mine, Mine says this, I'm in the ESV. It says, you shall never wash my feet. Now, again, this is another one of these places where you lose a little bit of the translation of the emphasis on what Peter is saying. Peter just doesn't look at Jesus and say, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus looks, I'm sorry, uh, Peter looks at Jesus and says, Lord, no, absolutely not. I am putting my foot down. You will no, not ever wash my feet. And, in, and in really, in, in, the, in the original language, there is this, this emphasis here that, that you see Peter really literally putting his dirty foot down and really putting his dirty foot in his mouth. Because, because what, what Jesus does and he responds this way, and listen, this is, this is, this is, this is congruent, this is parallel to all, that Jesus, all of Jesus' ministry uh, previously. That, that Jesus used physical stories to make a spiritual point. And he's doing it with Peter. And he looks at Peter and says, if, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Now that's, a, that's, a pre- that's, a, that's, that's a pretty serious point that Jesus is making there. And listen, Peter gets it. The, sp- the spiritual point, is, it's not so much about washing the feet. It's not about Jesus really looking at Peter and saying, if I don't wash your feet, you have no, uh, you have no part of, uh, of me, no part of my kingdom. What Jesus is doing in this illustration, uh, Jesus is looking at, at, at Peter and saying, I am the only one that can wash away your sin. I'm the only one, Peter, that can make this right make you right with God. And, and so in this, in this picture, Jesus is looking Peter dead in the eye and saying, and th- this goes further into John 14, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except by or except through me. 
And, and so in this picture of, of, of foot washing, Jesus is telling Peter, I am the only way. I am the only, uh, my, my solution, my plan is the only way to resolve the separation mankind has with God. Now, Jesus is gracious. Look what he does. First of all, Simon Peter looks at Jesus and said, well, if that's the case, forget my, forget my feet. Give me a bath. Wash all of me. Because I, and, 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 and the reason Peter can say that is, is because Peter knows who Jesus is. Peter has been walking with Christ in his ministry. Peter has experienced the miracles. Peter has seen, seen Jesus as God come in flesh. He might not have the full understanding that, 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 uh, that Jesus is coming first as a suffering servant, and then he will come later as the, as the conquering king. But he knows that Jesus is the only way, and so he gives Jesus the green light. Pull out the water hose, spray me down, wash me. Now look at, look, look, look at the way that Jesus responds there. And this is so important. If, and they, there, there are really two things, and I, I, you know, I keep pointing to these contrasts that, that are happening in this, uh, in, in this text and really in, in, in the entire Gospel of John. But in this, in, in, this, in, in this contrast, Jesus again looks at Peter and he answers him this. And, and, and I think that for us, and I'll, I'll get to this more in application later, but for us, it really is the question of whether we believe in Christ or we don't. Because Jesus looks at Peter and says, you know, Peter, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And, and so in that, in that statement of grace, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, listen, yeah, I, I, I love your heart. But you're clean. You have bathed completely. You have been covered in my grace. Your sins have been forgiven. And so he's, he looks at Peter and he says, you're clean. It's okay. You don't need a bath. You just need a little bit of a washing. And so in many ways, you, 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 you and I, uh, if you're a believer, we've, been, we've had a bath. We, we smell good. <laughs> Except sometimes our feet get a little dirty. Because we are walking in a sinful world. We are still dealing with remaining sin, even in our own lives. And we, and we sin. You sin, I sin. We still sin. There's no one perfect, no, not one. We still, the only, the only righteousness that we have is Christ's righteousness. You know, the, the whole point of Matthew 5, 48, you be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. The only way that it can happen is if we confess Christ as our Savior, unless we take on his righteousness that he gives us. But Jesus makes a pretty, another one of those, and I would say a shocking statement. It probably was a shock to the disciples at this time. Because he looks at the disciples and he's, uh, in, his, in, his, in his answer to the Peter, he says, Peter, you're clean, but not every one of you. And so it really had to call into question uh, uh, there immediately, who's not clean? So Jesus, in verse 12, when he had washed their feet, he put back on those outer garments and he resumed his place at the table. And he said to them, again, this is all under the, under the aspect of teaching, teaching Jesus, uh, of, a, of a teaching Jesus using physical illustrations to make a spiritual point. He looks at his disciples and says, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and you call me Lord 
And guess what? You are right. I am the Lord. I am your teacher. I am your rabbi. I, I am the one you, you should learn from. But if I, if I am in that position of authority, and I am the one, while, while all of this discussion about jockeying for position is going on, and I'm the one who has the ultimate position of authority, if I'm the one that actually gets up and puts on, takes on my outer garment and takes on the position of a slave, shouldn't you do that too? And that's really the question he's posing to, to the disciples there. He says this, If then I, Lord, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Now this is a little rabbit. Let me chase a little rabbit here. You know, there are some individuals that would say that this is where uh, we believe that there should be an institution for foot washing within the church. Um, and there, listen, there's nothing wrong with foot washing. I've been a part of those, uh, a part of those uh, ceremonies before. I've had people wash my feet. And let, me, let me illustrate this because it, make, it makes the point in the next verse here. You know, have you, some of you, have you have anybody had your feet washed? Okay, yeah, many of you have had your feet washed. How many of you that just raised your hand went to that knowing, knowing you were going to be a part of foot, foot washing, and you clipped, you clipped your toenails, you scrubbed your feet really good, you shined them up, and you put your socks on and your shoes on. And, then, and listen, I, I did that. I knew that it was going to happen. I didn't want people looking, you know, I, looking at my feet and saying, Whoo. I'll wash your feet and I'll clip your toenails too. And, that, and just in that little illustration, it illustrates the heart behind it. Jesus, in his example, was taking on, taking on the, the form of a slave, doing the role, a very menial task, the lowest of lowest task. And he sets the example. He's simply using this as an illustration, verse 15, for I have given, listen, what Jesus says, I have given you an example. It's not the only way but that you can serve and, 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 and humble yourself and before your fellow men. But I have given you this example that you should also do as I have done to you. And so he looks his disciples in the eye and says, listen, you, you see what I've done? You go do it as well. And you serve others. And you lower yourself, and you serve, and you become a servant. Jesus goes on and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You know, if you look at the humility of Christ, the love of Christ, and the picture in this example that he is so clearly putting before his disciples, but he is also so clearly putting it before you and before me. And saying, if you, if you do this, people will take notice. I mean, you can literally drop down, and, 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 and I'm not going to expand on this much more, but just listen to what Jesus says in verse 31. Now, listen, you know, Judas has been, uh, has at this point, Judas has betrayed Christ. And so don't, don't, miss, don't miss the order, don't miss the order of what's happened in chapter 13. Jesus has knelt down and washed the feet of the 12, not the 11. He's, he, he has washed, he's washed Judas' feet. Now, that is extremely significant. And in, in the end of this, Jesus, I will go up to verse 21. Jesus, he's troubled and he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, there one, there, there's one of you among us that will betray me. That will turn, they will turn their back on me. And of course, <laughs> um, just as Jesus said, not all of you are clean. And by the way, that's probably just an act of grace. Jesus heard that. You just had to have heard, not every one of you are clean. And he would have had to hear, would have had to have heard, 
one of you is going to betray me. And so even in that, you see the truth had to cut at the heart of Jesus, but, but uh, cut at the heart of Judas, but, but it, was, it, it was too late. Judas had already made his decision. So Jesus gives him the bread dipped in wine and says, whatever you're going to go do, go do it quickly. And this is all to fulfill the scriptures. God knew. God knew all of this. And so in verse 31, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. That's a lot of glory going on. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. But I'll give you, I'll give you one, one last commandment, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Remember the example? Jesus is setting the example. You are to love one another. And by all of this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so in conclusion uh, this morning, there's really four questions that I was asking myself, uh, uh, points of application. I encourage you to, uh, to take out a sheet of paper and write these questions down, record these, and, 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 and meditate on these, especially as we're preparing for Easter and we're looking at this example of, example of Christ here. Really is... The, the, the first question that has to uh, the first question that has to be asked are you cleansed by Christ you know there there are two remember I talked about the contrast between individuals you had one who had been cleansed his name was Peter he still had sin to deal with he still walked in the world but Peter had made a decision on who Christ was. He knew of Christ's grace. He knew of Christ's forgiveness. He knew of Christ's love. And he embraced it. And he followed, and, 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 he, and he embraced the call to follow. But then you have Judas. And you and if you're like me, you're sitting there and you're asking the question, Judas, how in the world can you see Jesus in his ministry and see his acts of love and his grace? And you are so stubborn. You have driven your heels into the ground and you have made your decision to betray God's Son. And so there, there really is that, that point of question we have to ask all of ourselves in this room. Are you like Peter? Are, are you cleansed? And just, some, and, and just need a bath. Listen, we sin. First John 1 John 1.9 uh, makes, it, makes it very clear that we, that we still sin. God is faith. If you sin is what John writes. If you sin, God is faithful and just. If you confess your sins before him, he is faithful and just to cleanse you, to cleanse you, and take away all your unrighteousness. That goes for those of us who are believers. And listen, that goes for those of you in this room who are like Judas. Judas you are sitting here and you probably may be getting a little bit uncomfortable right now. And it's okay. I remember when I heard the gospel and I remember when I heard, uh, when I, when I heard of Jesus Christ and I heard of his forgiveness and I recognized that I am a sinner and that I need help and I need grace. Listen, it got a little hot in the room for me. Uh, I, I became a little uncomfortable. I, 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 I was... I was first coming in the recognition that, wow, I need grace. And Jesus is there to freely offer it. And so here's what I would say to you. If you are like Judas, please don't do what Judas did. Judas kept driving his heels into the ground and got to the point where he, where he just basically said, I will not give in. 
And you know, in the end, you know, in, in, in the end, what got Judas was his conscience. Because he knew what he had done. He tried to get back the silver. He ended up, the, 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 the pressure was so great, he hung himself. And, and, and so don't, don't, don't drive, don't be stubborn. Don't, don't drive your heels in the ground and say, I don't need Christ. Don't drive your heels in the ground and say, I don't need grace. Because there, there is a reality. And then this came, and uh, there's, there's this reality that, that I was just reminded of um, a couple of weeks ago uh, at a funeral that I, was, that I attended. And Steve Hall did a great job. And he said this. Steve basically looked at everybody in the room and said, listen, we're all going to die. Uh, we, we, we all, everybody in this room, if you, me, we, we are going to pass away. We are going to step into eternity. And the reality is that the only person that has walked this earth that has death figured out is Jesus. And that's why we can look up to the Lord and we can sing those songs. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised, listen, raised this life up from the dead. I mean, it is that picture. Listen, when, when I baptized somebody, and then when I was baptizing Jocelyn Hunter this morning, buried, and it's a picture. It's a picture with symbolism. There's meaning in the mode. Buried with Christ. You are identifying with Christ in his death. But just not his death. You are identifying with him in his resurrection. And, and so that's why you can say, Oh, praise the one who paid my debt. He just didn't pay your debt. He gave new life. And he said, and, and, and just through these words, these are not my words. This is not my idea. This is not something that I have drummed up uh, and just sitting in my office and, and, and thinking, you know, what can I share? These are the words of Christ. This is the gospel. This is God's plan for, for you and for me. And so I pray, my, my, my prayer, my prayer for you is that, you are, that, you're, that we become and recognize ourselves as a Peter. Forgiven, cleaned. Jesus looks at you and says, you have had your bath. You are covered. You are covered. You are forgiven. I've shed my blood for you. And I gave you new life. That is my prayer for each and every person that's sitting in this room right now. And my prayer for you is if you are digging, your, if you are digging in your heels like Judas... And you are running heads, let me just tell you, if you, are digging in your, if you are digging in your heels like Judas, you are running stubbornly and headstrong as fast as you can toward hell. And I know that's weighty. Ecclesiastes encourages us to consider the weighty things of this life. And I need you to consider what you're doing. I need you to consider, and literally all it is, is saying, oh, I am. And Jesus, I need you, and I need your grace, and I need your forgiveness. I need new life. And he will do that for you. It doesn't matter all that you've done in the past. There's nothing God cannot forgive you of. Even that while we were still sinners, Romans says 5.8, Christ died for us. Even while I, listen, when I, even while I, I was, I was a Judas at one point in time, running as fast as I can away from God and toward hell. And God graciously, through his word and by his spirit, said, follow me. And it's just this flip around. And you turn and you just like, you just, <gasps> life, I can breathe. Does it mean life's perfect and life's, life's without sin and life's not, uh, life's not difficult? No. Does it mean that I have a hope in the future of what will happen? Absolutely. Does it mean my eternity is secure? Absolutely. 
So the first question is, have, have I been cleansed by Christ? I just encourage you, you know, some of you may have, you may be a believer, and you may have unconfessed sin in your life. Confess it before the Lord. It does, listen, unconfessed sin affects your walk and your relationship with God. And God does not, God does not want you to be out of relationship with him. He is there to offer grace. Second question that I would, I would, that I would pose to you uh, in this, uh, from this text, and the question that I have asked myself, do I have a servant's heart? Do I have the willingness to take on the position of a slave? You know, Jesus in Mark 10, 45, he says, I didn't come, listen, yes, I am teacher and I am Lord, but I didn't come for you to serve me. I came to serve you and to lay my life down as a ransom for many. If you look at the entire book of uh, Philippians, there is actually a structure there of Christ giving his example, of Paul giving his example, of Timothy and Epaphroditus, the, their examples. And in all of that, in all of those examples, it's about humility, it's about love, it's about being a servant. And so do I have a servant's heart? The third question, am I willing to be an example? Because I was, those, those, listen, those run parallel. They have to go hand in hand. In order to have a servant's heart, you have to be willing to set the example. And sometimes that's not always easy. But Christ did leave, First Peter 2, did leave us an example that we should follow in his steps. And then finally, the fourth question. Do I have the will to serve those who have hurt me? Do I have the will to serve those who have stabbed me in the back? Do I have the will to, to offer grace and forgiveness when in the eyes of the world and, the, and in the flesh it's just about justice? Am I, willing to, am I willing to lay down my own desires and to be an example for Christ? An example to my fellow brothers and sisters. Am I willing, just as Jesus bent down and washed the feet of Judas, am I willing to do that? That's a, that's a hard question to ask. And listen, even in that example, it, 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 it causes it causes us to really think and to be wise with our answer because, because even in Judas, Judas still left, still went about carrying on what had been uh, prophesied about him, that he would be the one who would betray Jesus to the religious leaders of the day. He did it for money. And, and, and so even, in, even at that heart level, there are those who have motives there are, those who, there, there are those who will deny the truth in order, for, in, in order to have selfish gain. But we can still take on, listen, we can still take on the heart of Christ and extend grace and be a servant. You never know what would happen. Judas, he dug in his hills and uh, went into a Christless eternity. For those others that we may be coming in contact with in a similar situation, your grace you offer, the grace I offer, may be the very thing that turns their attention toward Christ. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for the example of Christ as we see this in John 13. And Lord, there is a reality that we all face when we are confronted with this text as we come to Easter Sunday. Lord, some of us have been cleaned in this room. Some of us have had a bath, so to speak. Some of us just need our feet to be washed. 
Lord, there's somebody, there's, there, there's, I know in a room this size, there are those individuals who are like Judas. And they will reject your love and they will reject your grace. They're doing it now. But Father, by your word and by your spirit, Father, I pray that you would convict them in this moment. And I pray that you will save them. I pray that you would break their heart of stone and give them a new heart. I pray that you would help them to see truth. I pray that you would help them. I pray that you would help them to see the need of salvation. God, everyone in this, every one of us in this room one of those two places. We either have been washed by Christ, cleansed by Him, or we have not. And so, Father, I pray that in in preparation for Easter, as we prepare to celebrate Your incredible work on the cross, as we look to make much of Your resurrection, Father, it's my prayer that each of us in this room would celebrate, for those of us who are saved, would celebrate our salvation. And not only celebrate our salvation, but pass it on to somebody who needs to hear it. I want to ask that you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed, every single person. Can I just ask the question? I'm the only one looking up here. If in this time you have come to realize that you are not clean, that you have the heart of Judas, but you want that to change, will you do me a favor? Nobody's looking. I'm looking. Will you do me a favor and just slip up your hand and hold it there so I can see it? Thank you. Thank you. Slip up your hand. if you Keep it holding so I can make sure there's several people who have raised their hand already. All right, you can let them down. Will you do me a favor? Let me, let me just speak to those of you who, wrote, who, who did raise your hand. And you have expressed a desire to want to change. Jesus is gracious. And he wants to give you new life. Do me a favor. I'm going to be standing up here at the front. I I saw your hands. I know who you are. Um, And I'm not here to embarrass you. Um, But I want to to give you a little bit more information. I want to share with you that, yes, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And so here in just a few minutes, um, just here in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask, ask this. We're going to have some pastors. They're going to be here at the front. In order, in order not, to, not to embarrass you, I'm going to ask Michael. Michael, will you just sing privately just for a minute? And then if you're, if you're a pastor, uh, will, you, will you come and join me just up here at the front? We'll, we'll be here. And if, you're, if, if you raised your hand, and you want to, want to talk to a pastor, we're going to be here available. I'm going to ask everybody else, keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And if you'll just stand up right now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to embarrass you, but salvation is a great thing, and I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to, I don't want you to 
miss out on this moment because I promise you, listen, there's just something that I, that I pray over my son every night. It's called God protect the seeds of faith that are in Jonathan's life. And I promise you, there is an enemy out there that wants to, wants to destroy those seeds of faith that have been planted in your life right now. And so if you'll do me a favor, heads bowed, eyes closed. I've got a couple of pastors here at the front that want to walk with you. Would you mind just standing up and walking forward just for a moment? Nobody's looking. Nobody is. Nobody's going to embarrass you. And if you don't want to, it's okay. There is a communication card. Do me a favor. Please give me, just write me a note. Say, Jason, I want to talk to you. That's all you have to put. Jason, I want to talk to you. And there's going to be a, there's going to be a basket that's going to come, come by uh, here in just a little while. And we're going to, a lot of people submit communication cards. So I'm going to ask you that you, on that note, you just say, Jason, I need to talk. And I promise you, I'm going to follow up with you. That's if you don't want to come forward. And so if there's anybody who wants to come forward and receive the free gift of Jesus Christ right now, stand up and come forward. If you want to, again, that communication card is it's there for you as well. Please fill it out for me. Please, please turn it in. Because listen, it, it's, it's so much easier for you to make a commitment in this moment than it is, and I'm, just, I'm telling you for experience. I walked out of the church when God called me to salvation and said, Jason, I will save you if you will come. I didn't walk forward. I got in my car, and I made it about two miles. And then I turned around, and I went and knocked on my pastor's house. Thankfully, I knew where he lived because I just couldn't, I couldn't get it off my heart. And I didn't, want, I didn't want Satan robbing that seed of faith. Thank you for your commitment. And thank you for recognizing that, listen, thank you for recognizing that God is at work in your life right now. If you're a believer, I just want you to know that, and you need to just come before the altar and lay it before the Lord, and lay, lay, lay an unconfessed sin before the Lord, or maybe just come and pray and say, God, thank you for my salvation. I haven't thanked you enough for it. Maybe you thank God for your salvation every day, and you just want to come and pray and thank God. Maybe you just want to sit right there where you're at and, uh, and, and pray and thank God. Michael's going to come and lead us in, just in a time of commitment. I encourage you to, to worship the Lord in all His goodness for all the great things that He has done.